Kernels play a very important role determining the characteristics of both the prior and posterior distributions of Gaussian processes. But with many of them and countless variations, how do we choose the right one? Welcome to DigiLab, I'm Anna, and in the second part of our Gaussian processes series, we're going to explore how kernels shape the prior and posterior distributions of Gaussian processes. By the end of this video, you'll have a proper understanding of the different kernels that exist, their advantages, limitations, and applications, and how to combine them. Make sure you check out the written tutorial that accompanies this video, you'll find the link in the description below. Plus, you can download all their additional resources. Now, let's break down what to expect in this video. In this tutorial, we'll take a step-by-step -step approach to understand kernels and covariance matrices. We'll begin by laying the groundwork, explaining what kernels are and how they relate to covariance matrices. Then we'll dive into the practical applications with the kernel cookbook, exploring different kernel types and their uses. We'll explore how to combine kernels through multiplication and addition, and we'll discuss stationary and non-stationary kernels. Finally, we'll touch on AutoML in TwinLab, examining how kernels are selected automatically. Before we dive in, let's do a little recap from the previous video. In part one of the series, we introduced Gaussian processes, a powerful framework for probabilistic modeling. We discussed how Gaussian processes provide a non-parametric approach to regression and classification tasks. Unlike traditional parametric models, Gaussian processes offer a more flexible alternative. Rather than specifying a fixed set of parameters, Gaussian processes define a distribution over functions, enabling them to adapt to the complexity of the data. One of the key advantages of Gaussian processes lies in their ability to model non-linear relationships without explicitly defining the functional form of their underlying process. This makes Gaussian processes particularly well suited for tasks where the relationship between inputs and outputs is complex or unknown. Gaussian processes provide not only point predictions, but also measures of uncertainty associated with those predictions. This uncertainty quantification is crucial in decision-making processes, allowing users to make informed choices based on the reliability of the model predictions. We also illustrated how Gaussian processes capture correlations in the data. Consider temperature as an example. It behaves like a spreading wave where nearby temperatures are similar because of the heat flow causing them to gradually become less similar as you move away. This correlation structure can be described by the radial basis function kernel that we briefly covered in the last tutorial, which exhibits perfect correlation locally and decays with a length scale. Another example is tides, which occur every 12 hours, leading to strong periodic correlations. The height of water in a river, for example, correlates strongly every 12 hours, exhibiting oscillatory behavior. This can be described by the periodic kernel. In Gaussian process this modeling, we aim to capture these correlation processes. We can use different kernel functions to model various correlation structures, such as linear, decadian, or periodic ones. These functions can be combined, added, or multiplied to create models with diverse correlation structures. The heart of good Gaussian process modeling lies in the understanding and selecting appropriate kernel functions to capture the underlying patterns in the data effectively. This is why the kernel cookbook is so important. It's a comprehensive guide to understand the different types of kernels and their applications. This will allow you to choose the most appropriate kernel for your problem and to model complex relationships and patterns in your data more effectively. A kernel, also known as covariance function or similarity function, measures how similar pairs of input data points are to each other. More formally, it specifies the covariance between the function values at two input points. But how do we compute the covariance matrix? Let's start with a simple example before we give the general definition. We are going to start with two points. One is going to be 2 and the other one is going to be 4. And we're going to consider this kernel which is basically the radial basis function kernel with the hyperparameter set to 1. We are going to uh, calculate k for y and j equal to 1 and 2, so that is for calculations. So first we calculate k11 and we just need to substitute the points into the formula and compute each component of the matrix. The same way we compute k12, k21 and k22. 
So the covariance matrix looks like this. We just need to substitute these calculations into our matrix. This is the covariance matrix for a simple example with two data points, one being two and the other one being four, using a radial basis function kernel where the hyperparameters are set to one. Now let's have a look to the general definition. Given a set of input data points, we can use the kernel function to construct a covariance matrix. The covariance matrix captures the pairwise covariance between all pairs of data points. And in other words, the covariance matrix shows how much each pair of data points is related to each other. The elements of the covariance matrix are computed using the kernel function for each pair of data points. In matrix notation, this is how the covariance matrix looks like in general. The covariance matrix has several important properties. One is symmetry. The covariance matrix is symmetric. It's also positive seven definite, which means that all the eigenvalues are non-negative. If you don't know what the eigenvalues are, don't worry, you just need to know that they are special numbers related to matrices and this property makes sure that the covariance matrix behaves nicely and tells us valid things about how variables relate to each other. If the covariance matrix can be inverted, so that means that it's non-singular or that the determinant is not zero, its inverse is called the precision matrix. This is very important because it tells us about the relationships between variables and help us make predictions. The determinant of the covariance matrix gives us an idea of how spread out the data points are. A bigger determinant means that the data is more spread out, like if you have a lot of variation. And a smaller determinant means that the data is more clustered together, like if it's more uniform or or tightly gripped. The covariance matrix encodes the correlations between all pairs of data points, enable the Gaussian process to capture the underlying patterns and uncertainties in the data. Understanding kernels and their relationship to covariance matrices is fundamental in Gaussian processes. Kernels define the similarity between data points, while covariance matrices encapsulates the similarities and correlations, providing the foundation for Gaussian processes modeling. In the previous tutorial, we talked about two ways of understanding Gaussian processes as a way of modeling correlations and distributions over functions. Defining a kernel allows us to sample functions with the desired correlation structure. However, many might find it challenging to bridge the gap between the definition of covariance and the family of functions that have that structure. And this is where kernels come into play. Kernels serve as the mathematical bridge linking the covariance definition to the function space. When you pick a kernel, you're not just deciding how data points are related, but you're also setting up the characteristics of the functions you'll get. For example, the radial basis function kernel that we covered in the previous tutorial gives you really smooth functions. But with other kernels, you might get functions that aren't as smooth or continues. So when choosing a kernel, you have to think about more than just how the data points are connected. You also consider how smooth or continuous you want the functions to be. Linear kernels are one of the simplest yet effective kernels used in Gaussian processes. A linear kernel, also known as a dot product kernel, measures how similar two data points are by calculating the dot product. In other words, it checks how much they align with each other when you multiply their values together. Linear kernels produce models that are easy to interpret since the relationship between inputs and outputs is linear. This makes it straightforward to understand the contribution of each characteristic of the data to the predictions. Training Gaussian processes with linear kernels tend to be computationally efficient compared to more complex kernel functions. This efficiency makes linear kernels suitable for large-scale datasets. Linear kernels can only capture linear relationships between features and outputs. They may not be suitable for datasets with complex non-linear patterns as they cannot model non-linear dependencies. In cases where the true relationship between inputs and outputs is non-linear, using a linear kernel might lead to underfitting. When the model has not learned the patterns in the training data well and is unable to generalize well on the new data, resulting in poor predictive performance. Linear kernels provide a simple yet effective way to model linear relationships in Gaussian processes. While they offer advantages such as interpretability and computational efficiency, they may not be suitable for capturing complex nonlinear patterns in the data. 
Polynomial kernels are a popular choice for capturing nonlinear relationships and Gaussian processes. Polynomial kernels compute how similar two data points are by computing the dot product and their input data vectors to a certain power. Mathematically, the polynomial kernel between two vectors is defined like this. Here, c is the optional coefficient and d is a degree of the polynomial. The degree of the polynomial determines the complexity of the decision boundary or the curvature of the function learned by the Gaussian process. Higher degrees allow for more complex interactions between features, but also increase the risk of overfitting. Essentially, the model learns the train on data too well, to the point where it doesn't generalize well to new unseen data. The coefficient c is like a volume knob. It adjusts how loud the higher order terms in the polynomial are compared to the lower order ones. So if c is large, the higher degree interactions have a big influence on the similarity measure, but if c is small, they don't have that much impact. Polynomial kernels offer flexibility in countering nonlinear relationships without the computational costs of more complex kernel functions. They can model a wide range of nonlinear patterns in the data, making them suitable for diverse machine learning tasks. Choosing the appropriate degree and coefficient for the polynomial kernel and may require tuning through cross-validation, a technique that helps you find the best combination of parameters for your specific dataset and problem and get the best performance of your model. Higher degree polynomial kernels can lead to overfitting. Radial basis function kernels, also known as Gaussian kernels, are widely used in Gaussian processes due to their remarkable properties. The radial basis function kernel computes how similar two data points are based on the Euclidean distance between them. That means the length of the shortest path between two points in a straight line. You can think of it like the distance you would travel if you could fly directly from one point to another without any obstacles in your way. Mathematically, the radial basis function kernel is defined like this. This is the Euclidean distance between the two vectors and it can be calculated by this formula. L is the length scale, which determines the length of the wiggles in your function, and sigma is the output variance, a hyperparameter that controls the width of the kernel and determines the average distance of your function away from its mean. This kernel is characterized by its smoothness and infinite support. It means that the kernel considers all possible data points, no matter how how far away they are from each other, making it suitable for modeling functions that have smooth and continuous behavior. Radial basis function kernels offer a flexible and versatile approach to modeling non-linear relationships in Gaussian processes. They can capture smooth and continuous functions, making them suitable for a wide range of applications. Choosing the appropriate variance for the radial basis function kernel can be challenging and may require careful tuning through cross-validation. These kernels may struggle with modeling discontinuous or highly oscillatory functions as they prioritize smoothness in their predictions. In addition to linear polynomial and radial basis function kernels, there exist other several types of kernels that offer unique properties and applications in Gaussian processes. Let's briefly introduce three of these kernels, the Matern kernel, the periodic kernel, and the spectral mixture kernel. The Matern kernel is a flexible class of kernels that generalizes the radial basis function kernel. It's characterized by two hyperparameters, the length scale and the smoothness parameter. Mathematically, the Matern kernel is defined like this. Here, R represents the distance between two points, gamma is the gamma function, and this is all what you need to know. The Matern kernel offers a trade-off between the smoothness and computational efficiency. When adjusting the smoothness parameter, you can control the flexibility of the kernel and tailor it to specific characteristics of the data. The periodic kernel is designed to model periodic patterns in data, such as seasonal fluctuations in time series data or periodic spatial patterns. Mathematically, the periodic kernel is defined like this. Here, p represents the period of the period pattern, distance between repetitions of the function, and l is the length scale same as in the radial basis function kernel. The periodic kernel works well when data repeats itself over and over again, like the seasons or the phases of the moon. Imagine you're studying temperature data over the course of a year. The periodic kernel helps you see how similar temperatures are at different times of the year, taking into account that summer temperatures are similar to other summers and winter temperatures are similar to other winters.
the spectral mixture kernel is a flexible kernel that models complex functions as a weighted sum. So some of the functions can be used more or less than others. These components are sinusoidal components, which are functions that oscillate or repeat in a regular wave-like pattern. Mathematically, the spectral mixture kernel is defined like this. These are the weights of the I component and lambda denotes the length scale of the I component, where n is the number of components. The spectral mixture kernel is a versatile tool for understanding functions that have different kinds of wavy patterns. Combining multiple sinusoidal components with different frequencies and weights, this kernel can capture a wide range of patterns and structures in the data. The kernels discussed so far are useful when dealing with homogeneous data types. Homogeneous data types refer to data that are the same kind of nature. In other words, all the data points in the dataset share similar characteristics or properties. For example, if you have a dataset of temperatures recorded at different times, where each data point represents a temperature value, then the data is homogeneous because it's all temperature data. However, what if you have multiple types of features and want to regress on all of them together? One common approach approach is to add or multiply in kernels together. Multiplying together kernels is a standard method to combine two kernels, specifically when they are defined on different inputs to your function. Roughly speaking, multiplying together kernels is a standard method to combine two kernels, especially when they are defined on different inputs to your function. Roughly speaking, multiplying two kernels can be thought of as an AND operation. Multiplying a linear kernel with a periodic kernel results in a periodic function with increasing amplitude as we move away from the origin. Multiplying two linear kernels results in functions that are quadratic. When you multiply two kernels that each depend on only one input dimension, you're essentially combining them to create a new kernel that considers variations across both dimensions. Imagine you have two separate measurements, like temperature and humidity. If you multiply kernels that capture the similarity of temperature values and humidity values separately, the resulting kernel will consider both factors together. Adding two kernels together can be thought of as an OR operation, where the resulting kernel has a high value if either of the base kernels has a high value. Adding a linear kernel and a periodic kernel results in periodic functions with an increasing mean as we move away from the origin. Combining a radial basis function kernel with white noise results in a smooth function with some level of noise added. The radial basis function kernel captures smooth trends, while the white noise adds random fluctuations resulting in a function that is smooth overall but with occasional small random variations. When you add kernels that depend only on a single input dimension, you are essentially combining them to create a new kernel that considers each dimension separately. Imagine you have two separate measurements like temperature and humidity. If you add kernels that capture the similarity of temperature values and humidity values separately, the resulting kernel will consider both factors but treat them as independent dimensions. Let's talk now about stationary and non-stationary kernels. A stationary kernel assumes that the correlation structure remains constant across all data points. In other words, it implies that the degree of correlation between data points does not depend on their absolute positions, but only on their relative distances. In contrast, a non-stationary kernel allows the correlation structure to vary across all data points. This means that the degree of correlation between data points can change depending on their absolute positions. Consider the example of a step function. In the flat regions, points are correlated over a very long distance, while over the step itself, correlation exists only over a short distance. This makes modeling step functions challenging for standard stationary Gaussian processes. Understanding the distinction between stationary and non-stationary kernels is essential for selecting appropriate models that can effectively capture the correlation structures present in the data. The radial basis function kernel is a classic example of a stationary kernel. It assumes that the correlation between data points decreases smoothly with increasing distance, without any dependence 
on their absolute positions. The midterm kernel is another example of a stationary kernel. It generalizes the radial basis function kernel and includes a parameter that controls the smoothness of the correlation function. The periodic kernel is a prime example of a non-stationary kernel. The degree of correlation between data points depends on their absolute positions relative to the periodicity of the pattern. The linear kernel is often considered a non-stationary kernel when used in isolation. However, when combined with other kernels, such as a periodic kernel, it can contribute to creating non-stationary correlation structures. Similar to the linear kernel, Kernel, the polynomial kernel can also contribute to non-stationary correlation structures when combined with other kernels. It's important to note that the distinction between stationary kernels and non-stationary kernels is not always a clear cut, and the categorization may depend on the context and the usage of the kernels. Additionally, some kernels may exhibit both stationary and non-stationary properties, depending on the value of their hyperparameters or how they are combined with other kernels. Imagine there was a tool that could select the most appropriate kernel depending on your data, so you didn't have to manually experiment with the different options. Wouldn't that be fantastic? AutoML in TwinLab does exactly that. TwinLab is our cloud-based platform for applying probabilistic machine learning to your simulations, experiments, or sensor data. This means it adds uncertainty quantification to your model outputs, so it's especially useful when you need to make predictive decisions based on limited or sparse data. One of the key features of TwinLab is its use of automated machine learning to determine the best kernel for your data. With TwinLab, users don't need to manually select the kernel. Instead, the platform employs model selection techniques to identify the kernel that best fits the data. But more on this on part 3 of the series. Now, Time for a little recap. In the kernel cookbook, we have explored the fundamental concepts of kernels. Kernels play a crucial role in defining the similarity between data points and encoding prior knowledge about the problem domain. We have discussed various types of kernels, including linear, polynomial, radial basis function, matern, periodic, and spectral mixture kernels, as well as how combine these kernels, each offering unique properties and applications in Gaussian processes. From progression and classification tasks to time series forecasts, and spatial modeling, Gaussian processes are equipped with appropriate kernels are excellent tools for modeling complex nonlinear relationships in data. They offer flexibility, robustness, and uncertainty quantification, making them suitable for diverse machine learning and statistical modeling tasks across various domains. And this is all for our second video of the series. But what is next? You can continue exploring different kernels on the Streamlight app in the resources section by playing around with different hyperparameters. You can also read the reading tutorial where more examples are worked out and we dive deeper into the mathematical formulation of some of the concepts explored in this video. To delve deeper, you can plot combinations of kernels and explore the resulting graphs. In the next video of the series, we'll dive into a hands-on example in Python utilizing TwinLab. We'll explore how to understand the factors and features that drive outcomes, optimizing sampling, and automate kernel selection. Don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated with our latest tutorials and upcoming content. Make sure to download the video resources on the DigiLab website, where you can also find more courses on data science and AI. You can also find the written tutorial link in the description. Thank you so much for joining me in this adventure. I can't wait to see you on the next one.